Sweet. Thank you, Sean. Hey, folks. I can't see you with the bright lights, but my name is Ari Kalfayan, like Sean said. And before we get started, uh, as the first employee at Weights and Bias and part of the founding team, I just want to say how fucking amazing it is to be on this stage and see this community so engaged and how it's grown over the last, you know, five and a half years. I've seen the blood, sweat, and tears the teams put, like, overnight, like, working through the night, getting the demos done, even to this day. And it's an honor to get to participate in this way on behalf of AWS and sponsor this event. So thank you for joining us today. And I have the pleasure of introducing our first inaugural Gen AI cohort today. So without further ado, Mikhail. Can people hear me? Oh, wow. Well, this is like a rock concert. My god. Very cool. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mikhail. I'm one of the co-founders of Storia. We are building a creative assistant for storytelling. And we're starting by supercharging the pre-production process of, uh, of film and television projects. And my background is I have about a decade of experience researching and engineering AI systems. And before that, I, my past life, I built some of the earliest deep learning systems for conversational AI at Stanford, at Stanford University, and then also was one of the founding members of the uh, Alexa AI's first special projects team, where I built the organization's first LLMs. And uh, yeah, really excited to be here. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Max. I'm CEO and co-founder of NextLab. Me and my co-founders have been working in the time series field for the last decade, and we're building foundational models for time series. I want to use the intro to also mention that NextLab is founded by members of the Latinx and LGTB uh, community. And we believe that not only transformer-based architectures will uh, benefit from diversity, but the whole field could use more diversity. Hi, um, my name is Iman. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Protopia AI. Uh, prior to Protopia, I was at NVIDIA for about a decade where um, I worked on distributed training of large language models and enabling uh, thousands of GPUs to kind of train those models. Um, and we've started Protopia with kind of identifying a problem space uh, in the enterprise adoption of machine learning that's very focused on data protection and data ownership. Um, and thanks for being here. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Bernardo Aceituno. I'm the co-founder of Stack AI. Stack AI is basically the simplest and most reliable way to build your own LLM application. With a simple clicks and drag and drops, you can have a custom chatbot with your own data, securely deployed and auto-scalable and auto-replicated on the cloud for your website, running and easy to manage and maintainable by your team. Uh, before founding Stack AI, me and my co-founder were doing our PhDs at MIT. Uh, we've been in the world of computer science and machine learning for over 10 years. And for a long time, we started doing research at places like uh, Facebook AI Research, now Meta AI, and NASA JPL. So yeah, pleasure to be here. Cool, pleasure for having you. So at Weights and Biases, one of my favorite things that I got to see is actually that you saw that photo of Carrie with OpenAI, right? And getting to see the robotics hand learn how to use its fingers and solve a Rubik's Cube. And this is like six years ago, right? Since then, I had a front row seat where I've got to work with, you know, Anthropic and Stability AI as part of my work at AWS and start the Gen AI Accelerator, but there's also a lot of hype around generative AI. So what's real and what are some of the practical applications folks can expect to see in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, I guess I'll get started. So I think Gen AI has come a long way and there are a lot of very cool demos on Twitter. Uh, I think that there is, we should probably think about Gen AI in terms of where, uh, not super high precision tasks yet, but really more about uh, prototyping and exploration and kind of these more like softer tasks where there's the ability to really supercharge creative endeavors and really get people going and get over sort of those initial maybe artistic or creative blocks that they might have. And so that's where we think there might be some benefit. Yeah, um, we think that there have been great advancements in terms of big models for language and for perception, but we're gonna uh, see more and more foundational models for time series. And this is 
really important because time is fundamental to understand anything that has to do with change, growth, and even decay. And furthermore, first-class citizens of the world, like businesses, systems, institutions, they don't really speak in images or languages. They, they speak in data. They speak in time series. So I think we're going to see a lot of very important practical applications in those uh, areas, in finance, IoT, healthcare, retail, uh, involving large time series models. And maybe what are some of the weird edge cases that we're going to see? Bernardo? Yeah, I think that people will be surprised in the next 12, 24 months about how much of the way we interact with data in the world is going to become some sort of chat interface. Whether if it is the way that we interact with our business data or the way that we interact with our friends or existing data, that really surprises me. As like, yeah, we see it. We have customers from all sorts of enterprises and markets building a chat or interface or even a, just a form interface to interact with whether what your connections are, what your where around you is, and build actions around it. So it's going to be a truly transformational way on the way that we ingest and interact with information. And then I think the audience may be curious, like, do we have any artists in the room? Raise your hand. Artists, writers, creatives, couple hands. I can't really see, honestly. <laughs> the lights are really bright. But like, the writer strike's going on in LA, right? And one of the main concerns is around, you know, creatives being replaced by AI. Do we think they're actually going to be replaced, or should they even be worried about this in the near term, or is it really like farther out? Yeah, I'm happy to take this question. And I think maybe one way to illustrate this in terms of how we at Storia think about what's going on with the creative community is a story that I'll share, actually. So when we released our first product, we actually had a woman named Charletta who reached out to us. And she basically said that she had recently had a stroke and she wanted to have the, she, but she didn't have the resources nor the budget to actually visualize and sort of explore what her stroke story could look like. And so she was applying to get early access to our tool. And so for us, when we look at what AI means in broader society, real stories are written by real people. And that's always going to be the case. AI is just going to be a powerful sidekick. And that's something that we are working toward. You know, we see all these amazing generative abilities, but the truth is that the questions to ask, the stories that are worth sharing, that's all something that anyone in this room who has the full wealth of human experience, we're only the ones that are able to do that. And so, you know, to the writers, the creatives, I think really what we should think about it is this is the sidekick for your creative abilities, right? It's about taking what the abilities you already have, going to the next level, doing it faster, more cheaply. Um, it's almost like thinking about what's happening now is the same paradigm shift when Photoshop came around. And all of a sudden, visual editing abilities were made available to so many more people than was previously the case. So people that are underprivileged communities, underprivileged walks of life, but even power users. Everyone really stands to gain from this. So I mean, when we launched the Gen AI Accelerator, I was shocked at how many companies came in from entertainment, right? Like, and they're really taking on that vertical. So how much faster is the creative process actually going to get? I would say that the, um, when we first, you know, we're building a storyboarding tool. That's one of the first products that we've actually released. And we've been onboarding directors and screenwriters uh, very gradually as to sort of see and show them what's possible with the technology today. One of our first users and our first sort of user interviews, when we showed them and got them to actually play with the tool, they literally said, how is this fucking possible? And that is what we're seeing time and time again, is just the speed the, the cost is way lower. I mean, it is orders of magnitude better. More richly expressive, more capable, just all these things. Uh, and that's really where I think there's going to be a lot of interest and in, in more improved capabilities. So bonus question here for the cohort. What are the coolest creative applications you've seen for generative AI? And what makes it so cool? I think I'm going to uh, give a shout out to another one of the cohort companies here. There's a company called Ello um, in the cohort that um, teaches kids um, to learn uh, reading better by providing kind of this uh, character, I think it's an elephant, um, that finds out what it is that a child can't read properly or what they're having trouble with and kind of creates a story around that to practice with the character. I think things like that in education especially um, are uh, going to be very uh, strong kind of uses of LLMs for uh, the broader community and society. 
I also want to give a shout out not to a cohort company, but I think Runway ML is actually doing a great job. Their Gen 1, Gen 2 stuff is pretty, pretty exemplary. Uh, and I think that you know, what's, that's still very early days, showing us a glimpse of what's possible, but I expect that there's going to be more really, really cool stuff in that vein that is going to really change how stories are told, how, how movies are made, how so many things are done. So good work if you're in the room, Chris. <laughs> I love Runway ML. We've been supporting them for a couple of years, and it was cool to see them. I mean, they contributed the best picture this year, right? The scene with The Rock. Um, oh, everywhere, all at once, yeah. everywhere. I, yeah, I'm blanking on the full name right now. Um, so I think let's move it to security and privacy for a second. I mean, enterprise companies want to use LLM, but data security and privacy is really an important subject for the enterprise to adopt LLMs. What are some of the concerns around security and privacy, and how can they assuage those concerns? Yeah, I'll take that one. So, yeah, we hear it all the time. People definitely want to understand where their data lives, what part of the data is being shared, and understand through the entire process where it's going. We've, we shape our entire product, actually, with this idea in mind. And there's a few players that are important here. First and most obvious, open source and language models are going to be very important for this as companies that start to like self-host and build on-prem solutions that may have to be trained with custom data that is safer and only controlled by them so that they can like, guarantee that it only exists there. But I think people also like, ignore a little bit what's the role that big model providers need to, need to play in there. Uh, being able to set up virtual clouds with foundation models is still very powerful. Foundation models can empower organizations to build AI to a very large magnitude of applications. Uh, with significantly less effort and resources than training one yourself. So there needs to be both players in there as we understand how this data moves around, how it's being used by players, and uh, what of people in terms of privacy is being shared as well. Yeah, just to um, add there, I think some of the concerns around data protection and privacy are actually um, more of a data ownership issue in that the enterprise where data gets gathered from a lot of different individuals, that kind of large amount of data starts becoming important to the enterprise that has gathered it. So when they want to use something like an LLM that's going to be hosted somewhere, the idea of exposing that information in plain text somewhere else can be problematic because much of that data has never lived outside of the four walls of the organization before. And so um, this is actually something that is not a problem just in generative AI and LLMs. This has been a problem for machine learning, especially when it's deployed in hosted form for a long time. And it is one of the main focuses of us at Protopia is enabling uh, essentially the enterprise to be able to access machine learning and use it without exposing the data in plain text form. Um, and so for the LLM world in particular, how that would work, we're actually setting up a sandbox with AWS um, that um, if you're interested, you can go to Protopia AI and sign up for early access. But essentially, it'll give you the ability to see what does it mean that when you query a language model, that query and whatever context you provide to it doesn't need to be in plain text. And the LLM can still provide accurate answers based off of that. So. You guys are insiders, right? Like We've seen a lot of different um, LLMs and companies spin out of major labs in the last couple of years. How do you think, think the like, large language model is going to develop? Is it going to verticalize? Is it one player that's going to own it all? Are there a variety of players that are going to move forward in this space? Let's keep it to like 30 seconds, maybe. Maybe. Uh I will go one step back and advocate in favor for open source uh, business models. We at Nixl are uh, completely open source, and we think that we are at the verge of a very important generational transformation. And one of the uh, elements that we have to make that transformation probably more helpful for everyone is to keep things open. So I definitely hope and think that we're going to see more and more proliferation of different companies, different players building open source models. So let's keep going with that for a second in closing, but we'll start with you, Max. How can people support you in building your open source framework for time series data? Yeah, so uh, just go to the GitHub and try to collaborate. We, we really think the future is going to be 
not only multi-model, but multi-temporal. So what we're trying to build is technology that fits into the large language models and allows you to ask questions not only about the past, but also about the future. So imagine being able not just to run analytics about what has happened, but also about what will happen. I think just um, taking that question of how uh, this particular audience can impact uh, what we're building, um, I think understanding the art of the possible is what the curious minds in this room are all about. And it's important to remind ourselves that technology, especially like LLMs and generative AI that has come to market at very high speed and speed to market has been the most important thing so far. Um, it's not always going to, at first blush, have the best answers, right, in terms of how to use it, how it should be deployed, what needs to be exposed, etc. And I think um, just uh, being able to bring this message to this crowd of go check out the type of things that this cohort is building or go try out the sandbox on AWS, I think that will ultimately just enhance the understanding at a broader level of what's possible. Um, and that will help all of the startups like ours. How about you, Bernardo? Yeah, I definitely think that in the future, uh, foundation models um, are going to become a big empower tool for most of the community. Um, not just for people that are experts in data science and ML, but in general for people that just want to get their hands dirty and build their own tool. Just like technologies like Wix and Shopify became enablers for society to enter the web, I think foundation models will be enablers for society to interact with data, process it, and, ge and generate with it. So uh, it's a very exciting future building on top of that. Thank you. In closing word, Mikhail, how can the audience help you? Uh, keep being awesome, I guess. No, I mean, seriously, uh, you know, we're, <laughs> I mean, be awesome, but also, you know, do other stuff too. Um, I would say that we're, we're onboarding people, directors, producers, screenwriters. If there's any people that do that kind of stuff, please come talk to me afterwards. Um, but otherwise, just developers are some of the most forward-thinking individuals in, in the world, right, and really pushing the frontiers. So keep being awesome. So in closing, um, I just want to thank Weights and Biases, the audience, all the sponsors for being here today. And if you're running an amazing machine learning startup, I'll be hanging out. And happy Pride Month, folks. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank nice. you.